Good morning. We're going to be in the Old Testament. <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter number 29, very famous passage of Scripture. It's a very comforting passage of Scripture for people who are discouraged. It's got a lot to teach us. So you'll find in Jeremiah chapter number 29, I do quite a bit of reading. I uh, do a lot of studying on a lot of subjects, but I'm kind of encouraged by this uh, attitude of not quitting. Amen. It's important to have a good attitude that you don't want to quit. You know, a gentleman who had invested for a lot of years, better part of 20 years, had done quite a bit of investing, and yet uh, had never really done more than ever break even. Early on in the life, he invested a little bit that he had, but uh, 30 years ago it was day trading, and that was before a lot of computer trading had gotten involved. A lot of trading that uh, began with algorithms back in 97, they had trading at a stock market crash, and uh, people got excited when the computer came in because they began to be able to day trade. And you remember people used to get jobs where they would work their job during the day and they would day trade in as much as they could sometimes from their computer, but then bosses started getting software that allowed them to look over their employees' shoulders to find out what it was they were doing. Day trading had become a very popular thing, so much so that some people even quit their job to day trade. They had some money invested and they would uh, get online and they would uh, trade stocks and they would hold on to a stock for maybe as little as just a couple minutes to sometimes a couple hours, and sometimes a couple days. It, it's, it's different than investing. investing. Investing is nothing like day trading. Day trading to a great degree is like gambling, to be honest. Because you don't always know which way something is going uh, on any given time. You're just trying to, to make an incremental a profit and try not to lose much and the advent of computers and computer software and, and of course these online trading houses made it possible as they begin to develop more tools to, to have these stop gaps and where you can put a, a, a sell order if you were going to lose more than 5% automatically you put it in a sell and it would sell uh, your stock so that you could not lose more than 5 or 7% but uh, what ended up happening over the years people had done well with that, but most people didn't. Most people would lose their shirt because to a great degree it became a lot like gambling. Because that's, that's really what day trading is, is gambling. But when the big investment houses begin to invest in big software, then they begin to create algorithms. And today, a good deal of the stock market trading is uh, done by algorithms. In fact, they're using this word that's very hot on Wall Street. Oh, artificial intelligence. Have you heard of artificial intelligence? The machines are upon us, right? Uh, now you're just looking for Arnold Schwarzenegger to come in and, and uh, go after folks. Well, artificial intelligence is here. It's real. It's here. It is the big thing. Uh, Google, Microsoft, they are pushing their artificial intelligences because what you're doing now is you're taking computers that are more than just algorithms, but they are being designed and they are being <clears throat> programmed to react to different stimulus in the market and to create a reaction from that. And, uh, the idea of computer learning, the computers can learn over time. When you're talking to your Google or your Siri or whatever, and you're asking them a question, what are they really doing? They're, they're, they're retrieving information for you, aren't they? They're searching the internet. On some level, that's the foundation for artificial intelligence. Well, in the stock trading market, these uh, computers, very big computers by very big investment houses, well, they, they, they can analyze the market. They read and scan the headlines all over the world for uh, news, and they make buying and selling decisions nearly independently of a human trader. They're programmed by humans to make these decisions, but if you can design it in such a way that with certain stimulus they make certain decisions, you will stay ahead uh, in a certain level of profit or percentage of profit, and they feel on some level that's a little more dependable than human traders. Uh, human traders, well, we have a lot of faults, but we also have a good deal of discernment. We can see kind of around the future, we can speculate. Uh, those artificial intelligences, they don't speculate yet. They do what they're programmed. And, and right now they're being programmed by people who are, of course, 
uh, programming in a certain way, but it's a scary future. Well, with the beginning of these computer trading algorithms, <clears throat> we had that flash crash. Remember that flash crash? And people's 401ks were wiped out in a day and then it bounced back and they said, well, what's the problem? Well, computer trading. Uh, basically, computers making decisions causing a cascade event for people who had options, uh, trades in the market, and, and it just became a big mess. So most people don't want to really know how the sausage is made. You just want your 401k to be doing better this year than it was last year, right? And most people can't say that in this recession, but most people just want things to be getting better. They want to retire comfortable. You'd like to retire rich, but you'd be happy if you could retire comfortable and uh, not have to worry about paying your bills uh, in your retirement. You, you just want to kind of ease out into the sunset in a nice gentle way and die peacefully in your sleep with the people you love around you and that kind of thing. Uh, that doesn't happen for most people, but that's the way most of us want it. Uh, when you're young, you don't want to die in a blaze of glory. When you're old, you just want to die not in pain and surrounded by people you love. Well, when the day traders began to get pinched, they got pinched by these computers because the computers can react faster than you. They make their decisions almost instantaneously. And uh, they make their decisions based on pre-programming, and they don't really have to think about it from all kinds of different angles. They, they're very linear in their approach. But the house began to win, and day traders began to get slaughtered. Day trading became a fool's errand because those same computers are analyzing the various trades at much faster speeds than a human can, and they have access to information humans don't, and they can see when a person is trading on a particular stock within a day. You know, within a day, you might trade that same stock three or four times trying to make a win. And the government has put some rules in place to make sure that you, if you lose, if you buy that stock back, you, you can't take the, the loss as a tax benefit. Am I speaking over anybody's head? I say, I know my wife. I see her eyes get glazed over. <laughs> this fellow for... for Decades just barely stayed above uh, water, if, if anything. Losing and gaining and losing and gaining, losing and gaining. Kept studying, kept persisting, kept learning, kept applying. Eventually, the rewards of investing began to, to benefit him and began to become successful. Now, you would think that after 20 years of failing, somebody might give up. But in those 20 years, you learn stuff like don't be greedy. <laughs> learn to be measured, learn to be dispassionate, learn to take your emotions out of the game, and, 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 and most importantly, learn to, to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Because what's most important in life? Getting rich? Being comfortable? Or in the end, pleasing the Lord? Well, in the end, if you keep going, you eventually win. But you have to learn. See, winners, winners take correction. Winners take chastening. Winners take courage. In the end, winners don't quit. If anything we see through our series through Acts and the life of the Apostle Paul is that he is constantly taking correction, chastening, and courage, and he never quits. And in the end, when it's time for him to end this life, he says, I have finished my course. I've run the race. And there's a crown of life laid up for him. And you say, he had a pretty bad, he, he had some pretty discouraging moments through his life, but he didn't quit. And I want to encourage you today, don't quit pursuing that which is good. Take your correction, take your chastening, and take courage and go forward. Let's look at our passage today because in the Old Testament book of Jeremiah, we see that the people of Judah are being corrected. They are being chastened to the Lord. And God has had enough, but he is not done with them. 
And you may find yourself in a situation where because of your sin in your life, God will correct you, but it doesn't mean that he is done with you. If you're born again and God's done with you, you'll know it because you'll be gone. But there is a different way that God deals in his relationship with you than when he deals with the world. And we are going to be contrasting that here in the Old Testament and in the New Testament this morning in the next 20 to 25 minutes because we are going to look at this concept of is God punishing you or is he correcting you? Here in this Old Testament passage, we see that God is dealing with Judah in a way where he indeed feels like he is punishing them, but he is in the process of correcting them. They had already been punished. And the people of Judah had been preserved and taken out of the land of Judah and had been sent to Babylon. And Babylon was the place of exile, but really it was God's place of correction. He had discomforted them and taken them out of their old lives and brought them to a new place. In Jeremiah chapter 9 and 29, the Bible says, Now these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem unto the residual of the elders which were carried away, captives, and to the priests, and to the prophets, and to all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. After that, Jeconiah, the king, and the queen, and the eunuchs, and the princes of Judah, and Jerusalem and the carpenters and the smiths were departed from Jerusalem by the hand of Elisha, the son of Shaphan. <clears throat> All that stuff down to basically at Nebuchadnezzar's order. Verse 4. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, unto all that are carried away captives, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem unto Babylon. In that moment, God had done some punishing. See, God was very unhappy with their sin. These people had let their sin become their identity. They had let their sin overwhelm them to the place where their sins became so practiced in their life that even their religion had become perverted. Even their religion had begun to change to suit their lifestyles. And the sins that they had become comfortable with. And this had become epidemic because it wasn't just one area. It had really become polluted in almost every area of their thinking. To the fact that they began to absorb other gods and other religions. That really suited them a little more practically. They become pragmatists. They, they like to take something from this religion, that religion, and these religions. and You know, all the soft stuff. All the comfortable stuff that made them feel good about living just whatever way they wanted to live. They were really moving progressively to a state where they were doing what was right in their own eyes. And then finding a way to justify it by picking and choosing what religions they wanted. And what beliefs and what philosophies suited them. Uh, let's just say that in their relationship with God, they became gods unto themselves. During this period of time, the, the Bible says, the fool has said in their heart, there is no God, or literally, no, no God for me. Where they have become their own gods, their own lords. They have made their own decisions about everything in life, and, and, and they weren't really afraid or feared God. They had no respect for the God of the Bible, and the God who set the rules, the God who set the standards, and said, this is the way you ought to live, and these are the things that you ought to hold true and dear to your heart. These are the beliefs that should guide you. Ah, those are too restrictive for we want our own. And so as a result of this, they, they, in their relationship with God, had gotten to the place where they had very, very little room for any real God. So that even their prophets would lie to them. Their, their preachers would tell them what they wanted to hear rather than what they needed to hear. Well, that sounds very familiar with the way things are today, but that can happen in a society. But you know that happens in people's personal lives too. Well, God disrupted this by disrupting their life. Allowed another nation to come in and bring wreck and ruin to Israel and then to Judah. Because God had had enough of it. And in it, uh, there were some punishing moments. It, it was not a pleasant time. And yet God was not done with his people. Even though he had hurt, even though his stroke had, 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 had been painful. 
He had uprooted them out of the lions and, and taken them into a foreign land. And yet, it was God's will. See, Jeremiah the prophet was one of the few men actually telling them the truth before it all happened. All the other prophets said, oh no, God is going to bless you forever. No, God is going to give you victory over your enemies. God is going to do all this. God wants you to be prosperous. He wants you to be victorious. And it's not unlike the preachers you hear on TV today, the ticklers of men's ears. All they tell you is that God wants you to be rich and prosperous. He wants the best for you. The difference is God's best for you is different than the way they envision God's best for themselves. And definitely different than the way Joel Olstein envisions God's best for you. Those are the false prophets of the day. They don't ever tell people what they need to hear. They tell people what they want to hear. And those prophets profit. Those preachers get rich. Preaching God wants his riches for you. God does want his riches for you, but not the way they interpret it. His riches are not man's riches. It's much different. And you might find that God in your life has also uprooted you. You might have come from a very comfortable place in this country or perhaps somewhere around the world where you say, you know, I looked pretty good back then, but I thought it would be better in America. And in some ways, maybe it is. But then you come to some place like New York, and all of a sudden, you're working like crazy just to pay your rent. You're putting in an enormous amount of hours to, to get rich because you thought you'd get rich here. And in some ways, you might be doing better, but man, if you even slacked up a little bit, your rent and your utilities and the car payment and your insurance and everything costs so much. New York City is the most expensive place in the country. And it's in the top, I think, five expensive, most expensive places in the whole world. Well, it's, it's expensive. Don't come cheap. Wages are always lagging behind the pressure of, of all the bills and the food costs. And, oh, my goodness. And you work so many hours to do it, and then you're tired all the time. You get to the place where you seem like you're too tired to enjoy all the fruits of your labor. And you say, God, why would you bring me here? And then you remember that you're working not just for yourself, but you're sending money home to people. I love an old story a Mexican fella told me. He says, you know, when I came to America, my family was living on $150 a, a, a week. Or $100 a week. It was $100 a week when I came to America. And, and, and I got here, and, and I was making just these dirt wages, and I was working <clears throat> as a day laborer, and I was getting paid cash. And, and I thought this was more money than I ever made in my life, but it cost so much for rent. And, and most of my check went just to pay the rent. And I shared and lived in an apartment with six, seven other men. But I sent money home. And I didn't have much left over, but I was able to send them an extra $50 a week home. And after about six months, they called and says, oh, you know, the money you send is great, but it's not enough. So-and-so, they need this for school, and they need that for the, you know, your uncle, he needs this operation, he needs this. Can you send an extra 50? So it worked harder, and I sent an extra 50, and, and I got promotions, and I got better skills, and I got paid a little better, and then I sent a little more. And in two years, I made a little bit more, but I'm sending more home, and I'm sending $400, $500 a month home. It's more than twice than they were living on before. And they call up and say, you know, we can't live on this. Can you send more money home? And he says, how can you not live on this? When I left just two years ago, you lived on less than half of this and everybody ate every day. And now you say you can't live on this, send more money. But you don't know how much I pay in rent and how much food costs here and how much everything costs. I can't even buy my clothes and you're buying new clothes for all the kids. You're buying clothes for the cousins and they won't even work. He says, how is it that they could live on that just two years ago and they can't live on it now and I can't even live? And you wonder, well, God, what are you doing in my life? Did God bring me here. Oh, yeah, he brought you. And you're here, but he, he knows he's doing something in your life. He is here making you, shaving you, shaping you into something better. And God took the people of, of Judah and he took them to Babylon and the prophet Jeremiah promised them 
that this was God's will? How could it be God's will to destroy the temple, to separate his people from the, the rituals of worship at the temple because God was trying to show him it's not a place an earth and rituals that matter. It is a relationship with their God. They had all the rituals. They had the Roman Catholicism of the ancient Old Testament. They had the motions that they could go through and all the rituals and the baptisms and the water and the sprinkling and the priests. And they had all the minutia. And it didn't make them better people and it didn't make them any closer to God. They go in on Saturday and they do their worship and Monday or Sunday through Friday they were the same people. They were just as wicked, if not worse. Even their priests were wicked. God separated them from all of that to show them it is about you and me and these things are in the way. And Jeremiah the prophet prophesied to them and he prophesied to them this comforting word. Verse 4, thus said the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, and not all that are carried away captives, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem unto Babylon. Build ye houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat the fruit there of them. What is he saying? He says, you're not coming back soon. Settle in. This isn't your home anymore. It may be where your heart is, but it's not where your home is anymore. And I know many of you can say that too. Your heart is back home in your country because you remember your childhood, you remember the people, you remember that warmness, your identity, your culture, your heritage, but that's where your heart is, but it's not where your home is anymore. Your home is in this new city. He says, while you're over there, build your houses, live in them. Plant your gardens, eat the fruit thereof. Take ye wives, beget sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to Husbands, oh boy, we don't do that today. I tell you, here in this city, that's the thing that's missing in this zip code. Uh, less than forty percent of the people in this zip code are married. Can you believe that? One of the highest paid zip codes in the entire world is right here in this zip code. The average median income one hundred thirty-six thousand in the one one two one five zip code, and yet sixty percent of the people refuse to get married today. <sighs> no, he says you're going to settle in, marry, have your children, bear sons. What does it say? Bear sons and daughters that ye may be increased there and not diminished. And seek the peace of the city where, whither I have caused you. See, I, the Lord speaking, have caused you to be carried away captives. And pray unto the Lord and pray unto the living God for it. For in the peace thereof shall ye have peace. Now, we got to stop here for just a moment because old Babylon... <clears throat> 2,500 years ago, it was a pretty wicked place. It was a very metropolitan place. They had people from all over the Middle East, from Asia, from north of the Scythians, from India, and uh, from the Middle East, and it was a great trading hub, going all the way from North Africa all the way to, to China. In that city, people had a culture of being very, <clears throat> well, it was lascivious, it was lewd. Their religion was all sensual. It was, in fact, it was very sexual. And there was a good deal of their culture that was very sexual, as paganism is. Paganism, pa paganistic religion is sensual. It just is. The religion of the Bible is holy. It's spiritual. It doesn't mix spirituality with sensuality. It is pure. But the paganism of, of Babylon was, was epidemic, and it, it was glorious, it was rich, and they had uh, the famous uh, Hanging Gardens, which is probably a little city north of Babylon, and, and they had just technology, they had advancements, and it was a packed city, it was, it was packed. Lots and lots of people, and God knew where he was bringing them, he knew he was bringing them to a wicked place. But they were wicked, and this was an opportunity for them to separate themselves to a people consecrated unto God where they no longer had all the power and control, where they no longer had control of their own destiny and their own lives anymore, but they would be in a crucible. And you may find that you are put in a lot of situations, whether it's your home situation, your apartment situation, 
Uh, you're not able to live where you want to live. You're not able to do what you want to do. You're not able to do the kind of work that you want to do. A lot of compromises have to happen. You, you feel a little discouraged in your life because things aren't always going your way. And you have unmet expectations. Sometimes unrealistic expectations, but unmet expectations. It can be pretty discouraging because you feel like you're being pushed around. Have you felt that way? Pushed around to be among people you really don't want to be around? Pushed around in an environment that you're not comfortable with, that you don't like? People that you don't particularly like sometimes? You feel pressure, constant pressure to be something you know you don't want to be? Surely, the, the, the effects of Babylon would be felt on Israel and Judah as a whole, but they were already pagan, but out of this experience of Babylon, God would have them there for 70 years. But do you realize that the concept of a synagogue was created in Babylon? Read the experiences of life before Babylon. There's no synagogues in the Bible before Babylon. Temple worship was oriented around the temple. The concept of a synagogue was created from the Babylonian experience. Uh, they were also given a different calendar. They, 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 they kind of merged their calendar. Their calendar changed with the Babylonian calendar. That was similar. Uh, but even today, the scholars don't really know. They're not completely certain exactly what the Hebrew calendar was like before Babylon. So aspects of the calendar, aspects of, 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 of their thinking were shaped by the Babylonian experience, the, the synagogue experience was where Jews would have to get together and, and, and gather together. The word synagogue means with gathering or their little place for them to gather together and to identify themselves as Jews. Even as we have a church today, the concept of a church really is the outgrowth of a synagogue experience, which was the outgrowth of this experience of God's will of them being in the city. There was a lot of Jews that did not want to be there. They wrote songs and became famous songs of the 1960s. By the rivers of Babylon, right? Where we lie down. Some of you are old enough to remember that. There we wept when we remembered Zion. That was a popular song in the 60s. Well, think of 2560 BC. 2460 BC. That probably was a popular song then too. Written by Jews who, who, who remember uh, or, or long for a place that some of them, born over there in Babylon, never knew. A place they had never been to. A heritage they had never seen. And what was it? The same reason Daniel prayed toward Jerusalem to remember, hey, don't we get too comfortable in this place? This is your home, but it's not where your heart should be. This is your home, but it's not where your heart should be. And you and I today pray toward a heavenly Jerusalem. There is no place on this earth that we bow down this way or that way. We have no Mecca on earth. It is not required of you and me that we bow down in face toward Mecca. Because that's not where our God is. Even Jerusalem, that's not where our God is. Though the Jews prayed toward Jerusalem to remember where their heart was. You and I have a spiritual religion. And wherever we are, wherever God puts you in your Babylon, whatever Babylon, if it's New York City or the job you're stuck with or the marriage you're in, if that's your Babylon in your heart, learn to pray toward the heavenly Jerusalem. And you can face any direction and get there. Because when you bow down on your knees and you close your eyes, you should be transported to before the throne of God because even though that's not where your home is yet, that's where your heart should be, Christian. Your heart should be in heaven with God because one day you will be delivered out of this world back to the heavenly Jerusalem where your heart should be because that is your eventual true home. That's why we sing these old gospel songs and I love them. This world is not my home, I'm just the passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Right? Heaven beckons me, right? 
And Beck has been a heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. The people here are in Babylon. Jesus says, this is my will for you. God says, this is my will for you. And he says, even though you're in this wicked city, seek the peace of the city. That means pray for it. It also means work for it. Be involved in civil action. Be involved in civics. Be involved in business. Be involved in being honest. Amen? If you're a businessman, be an honest businessman. Somebody pays you for two pounds of meat, don't put your thumb on the scale. Don't cheat them a pound and a three quarters. Don't load it up with water. Inject your, inject your chicken breast with water to load it up and then sell it for three quarters of a pound more. Be honest when you seek peace. Be honest in all your dealings. Be, 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 be wise in all your dealings. Seek the peace of the city. He says, because I have put you there. And though you're not comfortable and though that's not where you want to be, Though that might be the apartment that you're in and you don't want to be, pray for the apartment, seek peace in the apartment, seek to be the guiding light, seek to be the Christian testimony wherever you are, because in doing so, you are bringing peace to yourself. Verse 8, for those that the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, let not your prophets nor your diviners that be in the midst of you deceive you, neither hearken to your dreams, which ye have caused to be dreamed. It's an interesting way of saying that. Because he knows that these people have still heaped up to themselves uh, preachers that tell them what they want to hear. And uh, right here he's saying, don't follow your dreams. Because these dreams come out of your own heart. They're not the will of God. Not always the will of God. You and I as Christians, our desire is to serve the Lord, to find out what he desires for us. Make his dreams for us your dreams. Too often we ask God to bless our dreams. God, bless our plans. God, bless our dreams. This is what we want for our lives. This is my plan for my life. God, bless it. And we always make the mistake of saying, God, is this what you want for my life? We don't ask him that. We tell God what we want. And then demand he blesses it. And if things don't go right, we, we get discouraged on God. And yet, did you even ask? Maybe, maybe what it is that you want is what God wants. But have you really been willing to put it on the altar and say, God, this is what I want, but I don't know what you want. But God, if you don't want this for me, take it from me. Have you ever done that? Whether it's your college, your career, perhaps it's a relationship you've been in. I mean, if you're married, you're already married. It's too late. <laughs> but if you're, you're dating someone, have you bothered to, to ask God if it's what he wants. And then when it doesn't work out, you blame God. God doesn't fail. God doesn't fail. If it doesn't work out, you're the one that failed. They're the one that failed. Maybe you failed to ask. Maybe you failed to see God. No, no, he says, you got dreams in your heart, but don't believe your own dreams or lies. You can pursue them, but so don't expect God to, to put the blessing on you. But you know what? If you have dreams in your own heart that is not what God wants for you, the devil will bless you. He'll tease you along. Oh, yes, he will. He'll give you success. How many young Christians got famous singing and acting? And the devil teased them along, said, just compromise a little more. Compromise, and I'll, I'll give you a little bit more. I'll make you famous. Well, the devil's got the power to make you famous. He's got the power to make you love to buy the world. He'll give you fame and fortune and everything you want, as, as old Freddie Mercury used to say. And he was thankful for his fans and all that, but it's not what God wanted. The lifestyle wasn't what God wanted, and he died early, he died young. He's a hero among men, but he didn't get right with the Lord Jesus Christ. He's looking up from hell. Rethinking all of his decisions, even today. Rethinking all of his decisions. If I had done it differently. He'd have found out in the end he wasn't a champion. You know who the true champions are? The ones that submit themselves to the Lord Jesus Christ. We are the champions of the world. 
Verse 9 says, For they falsely, or they prophesy falsely unto you in my name. I have not sent them, saith the Lord. Be discerning. Be able to parse your feelings from what God's will is. For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. That's tremendous. It's a long time, though. He says, after 70 years, I will visit you and I will do what I said I would do. And I will return you to this place, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Say the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me, and what? You're going to find me. Ye shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. And I will be found if you save the Lord. And I will turn away your captivity. See what's really going on here. I tell you what's going on here. We take this verse a lot of times to ourselves and encourage ourselves with it. And, and Pentecostals absolutely love it. Because they take it just from those couple verses right there. And then they say, God wants to bless you. He wants to bless you with a new Cadillac, brother. He wants to bless your wallet and make you fat and happy and comfortable. They'll say all that kind of stuff. That's not the context at all. <laughs> the context is chastening. The context is correction. The context is teaching these people not to quit. Doing right and following God. See, but the problem is they become self-willed. And so now what is God going to do? He's going to take away some of that freedom of their will. And he's going to put them in a place where they don't want to be. And he's going to push them around. He's going to let them be pushed around. And he's going to let them see that they belong to him. And that these hard times that are going to come into their lives is actually for their betterment. And this is an important distinction because... If you are a born-again Christian today, God is not punishing you for things you did in the past. He's not punishing you because you are an angry person or because you're a snide. And you know, why, why, why is that? Does not God punish? Well, of course, God punishes. Uh, but you know what punishment is? You know what justice is? I'll give you a real short, simple thing to hang on to. You know what justice is? It's getting even. That's what justice is. Scales of justice sit like this for a reason, right? The lady sits there, she's blind, and the scales sit. Are they tipped in your favor? Tipped away from you? If justice is just, then the scales are even, right? You got some candy over here, a little Turkish delight, you ought to have an equal amount of gold on this side. The scales of justice have to be even. If they're out of balance, it's got to be made just again. When God punishes sin, when he punishes wickedness and rebellion, when God punishes the world in the great tribulation, which is not soon uh, that far off in the future, God will be administering some justice. He'll be punishing. One of the reasons we believe that the Christian church and, and, and this particular Baptist church will be raptured before the tribulation and other good men that I know that believe in a pre-wrath position, they believe it's before the wrath. But the whole point is, it's, 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 uh, it's before the punishment. You say, well, why wouldn't God punish his people? Why wouldn't God punish you? If you're a born-again Christian today, why, if you had sinned, is God not going to punish you today for your sins in the past? You, you, you may have to suffer the consequences. You might have to say, suffer the residual effects of the sins of your past. But why, in, in a human sense, but why isn't God going to punish you? Why isn't he going to take his pound of flesh out of you? Well, that's the core of our theology. The core of our theology is God punished Jesus Christ. For our sins. God has already paid. Jesus has already paid. The price of your sins. 
Justice has already been paid. Jesus Christ took your sins on the cross. That's not just fluffy words and flowery language. Jesus took your punishment. And if God punished you twice for the same sins, it would be unjust, wouldn't it? To punish the innocent Jesus Christ who took your sins in your place and then to punish you again, that would be unjust. That wouldn't be fair. And God is just. Your sin has been paid for. It has been punished. So what is this that we find when you turn with me, if you will, to the New Testament book of Hebrews? Number five, you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. What is that? This is different. Because if you were to be punished for your sins, you would be punished in hell. It, 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 it would be a painful thing. Jesus says, people who go there, you're, he says, you're going you're gonna to pay every last dime. You're not going to be forgiven anything. Punishment is getting even. But God got even with Christ on the cross on your behalf. And so you are just, you declare just... But you have some problems in your life, right? You still have a sinful nature and you still have things in your character that you have internalized that have become a part of you. They're part of your character. They're part of your attitude. They're part of your worldview. The way you look at things, the way you interact with other people. These things may be sinful. They may not be good. Uh, they may actually harm you or hurt you. They might not be what God wants for you in your life. And you know they're not part of the character that reflects Christ. Is God going to punish you for those things? No, because he already punished Christ. What he is going to do is he is going to chasten and correct you. So when God is affecting change in your life, when he applies pressure, he is not getting even with you. He is trying to correct behavior. This is very important. When you're being spanked, it might feel like a distinction without a difference, doesn't it? But it is a very important difference. Because God is not taking the full amount. He's not just trying to get even with you. He's trying to correct behavior. And that is an important distinction. Because in the Christian life, you will find that when God corrects behavior, the chastening stops when you change. If he was to get even, it would go on and on and on until you paid everything. See, if you go to jail for a crime that you've committed and you're guilty... And they say you're going to do five years and no chance of parole. You're doing all five years. Even if after year one you say, you know what? I was really wrong. I shouldn't have done that. It doesn't matter. Glad you changed. I'm glad you changed your mind. you got four more years. Why? Because that's getting even. That's justice. That's the justice system. It's supposed to be, right? Till you pay everything you pay until you're even. Just because you had a change of heart, just because you admit, just because you cry to the judge, it doesn't mean that you don't deserve to get even with if you've really hurt somebody else, that other person says, they owe me. I need to be made whole and they owe me. they got to be punished. But with God, if you're born again and you've been released and Jesus Christ took your sins, he's not trying to get even with you. When you correct your attitude, when you correct your behavior, when that which is inside of you is purged out and what God wants to put in you is changed, and put in you, the correction stops because there's no longer a reason to correct you for that particular thing. That's different. And so God's trying to do something in you. He really does want the best for you. He wants you to become the best version of yourself, sure. But he wants you to become the best version of yourself in the sense that Christ is being formed in you. And there are aspects of the, the you, the authentic you, that don't jive with the authentic Jesus. <laughs> I 
And it's a process that goes on during the course of your life. And so the Bible says, don't give up when God's chastening you or correcting you. Don't be a quitter. Don't walk away from your faith. Don't get discouraged and become in the doldrums and say, oh, 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 I can't have what I want when I want it. And so I just won't do it. Then you're going to invite more correction. Because God loves you. He's going to chasten you. He's going to correct you. He's going to continue pressuring you and changing you to be what you need to be. The Jews were sent to Babylon for correction. Because it was there that they would become Jews again. It was there that they would have revival. It was there that all the, the, the rough edges of their stone were knocked off. Because what God is trying to do in you is a wonderful thing. It was once asked by Michelangelo <clears throat> that when he looks at a piece of marble, he, they'd say, how is it that you could possibly turn that block of marble into such beautiful, authentic, and perfect sculptures? He says, it's very easy. He says, I just look at it and I knock off everything that doesn't look like what I envision, what belongs there. And God has taken you, when you're born again, a marble that now has been purchased that belongs to him, and just a block. And God begins to knock everything off. And a lot of those are big things, right? Everything that doesn't look like Jesus and the character of Christ, he begins to knock it off and whack it out. And each stroke sometimes is very hard, sometimes it's very delicate, sometimes there's little chisel work in your life. But everything that doesn't look like the character of Christ has to come off. Until Christ be formed, until the image of Christ in you begins to reveal itself. And God will work on you day by day, month by month, year after year. Over the course of your entire life. Even if at the end of your life he's just chipping off tiny little things trying to get it just perfect. Until it's time for you to go home. And know that if this is going on in your life, it is because he loves you. Verse 6, in whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. That means if he is working your life, he has already received you. He has already <clears throat> made you his own and taken possession of you in your life. You belong to him and he belongs to you. He is your Lord and you are his servant. You are his child. So it encourages us. Endure, verse 7. If ye endure the chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is it whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then ye are bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have fathers after our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. We Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit means to make you a better person, God will chasten you, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth joyous, but it's grievous, but grievous nevertheless Afterwards, it yieldeth the personal, peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. It says, so don't be discouraged. No, it might take a long time and you might be going through something, but don't quit. Don't quit on God. Don't quit on church fellowship. When you are being chastened, when life is difficult, when your expectations aren't met, when things aren't working out the way you think they should, don't give up. It might be God chastening you. It might be God correcting you. It might be God trying to teach you to take courage. Because God has a plan. 
And this hardness is designed to take off some of that hard stuff, that things that don't belong in your life, and to change you and mold you into a better person. And I don't know why it is, but so many people were here in the city, instead of, of coming to church and fellowshipping more and, and getting together with the brethren, when hard times come to them, they drop out of church. That's the exact opposite thing that you should do. You shouldn't isolate yourself because then the devil has got you isolated. You need to be around people who are going to be able to lift you up, people who can share their faith, someone you can look at and draw courage from them. People who can share testimony of what God did in their life and how they went through something. And you can be encouraged to get through it with them. No, if you're going to be a winner in life, if you're going to be a victor because we are more than conquerors to Christ that loved us, we've got to be willing to take correction, take the chastening, and take courage. And don't quit on God. So I'll pray. Father, in the few moments we have here today, I 